Welcome to the panel on how to encourage young people to, to learn history and to get interested in, into, in history. Uh, the panel language will be English, but for those of you who would like Polish version, there is an earphone set available outside. And at the beginning, we're going to see two short videos as an introduction. Internet. Internet jako źródło wiedzy historycznej jest masowo wskazywane przez uczniów, którzy jednak nie potrafią wymienić konkretnych stron. Najczęściej przewijają się tak ogólne określenia jak YouTube, Wikipedia czy Facebook. Zaledwie jedna trzecia uczniów była w stanie wskazać jakąkolwiek stronę internetową traktującą o historii. O stronie Instytutu Pamięci Narodowej wspomniało po 0,4% badanych uczniów, ale odpowiednio 2% dorosłych Polaków i 18% nauczycieli historii. Aż 6% uczniów wymieniło TikToka w porównaniu do 0,3% dorosłych i ani jednego nauczyciela. The Institute of National Remembrance focuses its research of Polish history on the time of Poland's rebirth after World War I, the occupation during World War II and later communist enslavement until the regaining of sovereignty in 1990. Bearing in mind the need for remembrance of the enormity of the number of victims, legal responsibility to bring the perpetrators to justice and the obligation of the state to redress human rights violations, the IPN carries out its research, educational, commemorative and archival mission, both at home and abroad. Let us emphasize that there can be absolutely no consent for any forms of commemorating the totalitarian communist regime and people serving it.
Thank you very much. As we've seen in the first of these two videos, uh, young people are very active on social media and that's what, where we should uh, find them, where we should look for them. That's why I invited today uh, four distinguished panelists, uh, people who are uh, active in their various professions, but at the same time promote history and Polish history included uh, on social media. So starting this time from my right, not left, ladies first, uh, I have invited Ms. Alexandra Duda, uh, <clears throat> educator and guide uh, in Warsaw Rising Museum, a person who's probably the most knowledgeable in Warsaw, uh, where, where it comes to Warsaw Rising and not only history of occupied Poland. Uh, I have invited Katie Carr, Ms. Katie Carr. renowned musician and songwriter uh, who's already released six albums and is very active promoting Polish elements of Polish history in her work, in her artistic work. Uh, I have invited uh, Ms. Claire Mali, uh, renowned <laughs> author and broadcaster who's also uh, already released three books and the fourth is due to be released next year. And uh, you probably, you've probably read some of them, for instance, on Kristina Skarbek. And finally, uh, Mr. Scott Booth, uh, <clears throat> former Royal Marines Commando, uh, presently reconstructing, building a replica of a Spitfire fighter plane uh, flown by a Polish World War II pilot in Britain. Uh, and my name is Przemysław Janiga, I run the English language social media team for, for, for the IPN. And, of course, the videos, uh, videos you've, you've just seen, uh, the second one, referred to certain history distortion, uh, manipulation, <coughs> sorry, manipulation and distortion is something that we come across very often, uh, not only on social media, but we'll all agree, I'm sure, that uh, if we put enough effort into education, we'll, we will not have to address manipulation so often. So, uh, we're meeting here today to talk about education and most speci specifically on teaching history on social media because that's where uh, our target audience, young people, are. Uh, the IPN wants to keep up with these trends. Uh, that's why we have our English language social media channels, because both we want to address, uh, we, we want to reach young people, and we want to reach young people abroad. So we do it in English, the most popular uh, foreign language these days. Um, each of my panelists does it in their own way, through books, music, uh, aircraft replicas, or uh, instructing visitors to a museum on Polish history. So let's begin with what I think could be a suitable introduction uh, or follow up to the introduction. Uh, what is it? Uh, what is promoting Polish history for you? Is it like a hobby, passion? Is it a mission maybe? May I start? Alexander. Thank you for inviting me. Well, World War II shattered uh, the world my family uh, lived in. And um, in my family, we just cannot forget about all those wounds um, inflicted by, by two totalitarian systems. Um, uh, in my everyday work, I try to pay a debt to my incredible family members who suffered so much during World War II. One of the great-grandfathers um, perished in um, Kail Dachau. The other uh, went through three Nazi German concentration camps. And uh, the last one was uh, deported by the Soviets to a Gulag labor camp and he never came back. So on everyday basis, I think of them I think how comfortable my life is today that I don't have to address the problems they had to face um, 
in the past. And I believe that the values that united Polish people for so many centuries, such as uh, God, honor, and motherland, are truly beautiful and worth fighting for even today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Katie, what about you? Hello. Um, firstly, I'd like to say I'm so delighted to be here. Na prawdę jestem pod wrażeniem, że jestem tutaj w Warszawie. Thank you for having me. I'm a British songwriter with Polish roots, and um, my mother was Polish. She's no longer with us. Um, she's buried in Bielska Biała. My grandmother was a Guralka. My mother was a Guralka, and my grandfather was a prison prisoner in Auschwitz concentration camp number two two six six one, and he escaped, which is why I'm here. And I'm in my last ten years. I didn't speak Polish, and I've been learning the Polish language through the through the creation of of, of the songs that I've written, either in Polish or the learning of the songs. And for me, um, the history of Poland, there's so many untold stories. Um, and the closest um, relationship I have to those stories is my own family, as Alexandra said. You know, it's very, very inspiring. Um, and so for me, um, everything revolves around uh, the, the, the sharing of these stories through song, through song lyrics, and an ability to share that with new new generations, and um, giving a fresh insight to this history, which has been so poorly written about in the last hundred years. People come to Poland from abroad; they don't speak the language of Poland. They don't po the Polish language. And, and for me, it was so important to learn the Polish language so that I could understand the culture, so that I could write these songs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You mentioned that some of Polish history is poorly written about, but Claire writes very nice. So please. Dziękuję <laughs> bardzo. Okay, so I have no Polish links. I don't have any Polish heritage in my family. Uh, I am a historian and a, a broadcaster. And I first uh, became interested in Polish history during my first degree when I uh, took an option deliberately to study the history of Katyn. This was in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And when I finished my degree, I volunteered to teach English as a foreign language in Poland, in Bydgoszcz. Uh, in a summer camp with UNESCO. It was absolutely fantastic. Everything I'd learned then, it, it opened up and it, it lit a fire in me, you know, seeing the geopolitics of the situation of this nation and the history of it. So I, I take history very seriously. It is my job, I'm a professional, um, but I, am, I do not promote Polish history. I write, I research, I investigate, I try to correct some errors I've come across. I've written three books that are published. One was about an English lady, one was about a Polish lady, Christina Skarbek, uh, and one was about two German women during the Second World War. But I have to say that my next book is also going to be a Polish history book about Elżbieta Zawadzka because there is this very rich seam of untold or I think poorly told uh, Polish history, not by Poles, but in the West as well. And I agree with what Katie said about there is huge potential for us to do a better job as historians covering this ground, not to promote it, but to tell it. Mm -hmm. So two out of four, 50% is Polish history. <laughs> Kristina Skarbek, Elżbieta Zawadzka. <laughs> okay, what about you, Scott? Dzień dobry, everyone. Uh, like, like Claire, um, I I'm, have no Polish blood in me at all. Um, and, and really, by happenstance, I was able to... Um, learn a lot more about Poland and the Polish people. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, fly in a two-seated Spitfire in 2016 and um, whilst in the waiting area, a coffee table was made of a Rolls-Royce Griffin engine which used to power the late Mark Spitfires. Uh, I, I was so impressed with this that I decided that I absolutely needed to have one of these. Um, my girlfriend didn't agree with me, but uh, after 18 months of negotiation and a lot of research, I managed to find one. Um, it was purely coincidental that the engine that I actually um, managed to gain, which was a Rolls-Royce Merlin that did actually power the early Spitfires, came from a, a Polish Spitfire from 303 Squadron. Um, 
I managed to really regain uh, the history of the engine and the aircraft, and of course then I was able to retrieve the records of the aircraft, which gave me um, the opportunity to research the pilots who flew that particular aircraft too. Um, the Spitfire itself is incredibly rare. Um, it's a Mark IIb Spitfire. There was only 170 made. They were the first of the cannon arm Spitfires straight after the Battle of Britain. And actually, the Polish squadrons, especially 302 and 303 squadron, were armed with these cannon arm Spitfires immediately because the prowess of the Polish pilots was documented and well recognized by the end of the Battle of Britain. Um, the stories, however, then come to light. The, 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 the final pilot of this uh, particular Spitfire was Wing Commander Piotr Waguna, um, an incredible character, a very senior leader in the, 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 the Polish Air Force uh, management team at the time, who had led men um, in Poland through the evacuation and set up the squadrons in France and then was, uh, was setting up the squadrons in, in the United Kingdom. I knew none of this information. The only, the only information I knew really about the Polish history, certainly during um, the Second World War, was a limited amount of footage in the film The Battle of Britain. Um, I think everybody may have seen that film in this room, but it was limited to uh, repeat police, which became very famous within the film world, and the fact that the, the, the Polish were very aggressive, very professional, and very capable. The story of Piotr, and the, the, the remainder of the Polish pilots was just, um, it was inspirational. Um, and whilst I have no Polish blood in me, I almost certainly six years later feel like I do, and I am told by all my Polish friends that I have Polish blood somewhere. Um, but the story of the Polish people, and more importantly, and without forgetting the families they left behind and the journeys that they took, has been an absolute commitment for me to not only restore the Spitfire to flight, which is happening, making it the only 303 Squadron Spitfire and aircraft left in the world, um, but also to tell the story of those pilots and their families and the ground crews. Um, so Waguna really represents 18,000 Polish Air Force personnel, but their extended families as well. So the project, from my point of view, is the opportunity in the UK to tell the story broadly in the UK, but we have a worldwide audience, actually, um, from Australia to Europe to North America and everywhere else in between, where we have a huge following and it's a, it's a huge honour for me to be able to um, tell this story and, and tell it correctly. We're honoured to hear it, to be able to hear it. Thank you very much. So we're talking about uh, teaching young people history in uh, different ways, but the question is, why should we even teach them history? Is it necessary in their lives? Katie, what do you think? I think it's so important um, to share the correct history with the young people because the young people will soon be older people and, and it's so important to um, inspire the youth while they're young enough to, you know, to have that beautiful innocence and, and understanding. And so with the work that I do, the music that I sing, um, and the way it can relate to those young people. You know, I have, I have songs that um, are inspired by really serious topics. So for instance, um, I have a song called Commander's Car, which is inspired by the last 80 meters of an escape from Auschwitz concentration camp. Kazimierz Bichowski, a Polish boy scout, made this infamous escape with three other political prisoners. And it is good versus evil. It is, because Kazimierz, after his escape, joined the Armia Krajowa, which is the Polish resistance, underground Polish resistance movement. And the children can really relate. And these don't have to just be Polish children. I've taken 3,000 British children through learning this story and understanding that a role model doesn't have to be somebody um, a celebrity, but it can be somebody who actually they can relate to. And through the song and through the music video and through the film that we made about going to visit Kajik, um, the children have this opportunity to learn something in a fresh way and bring, um, bring out that beautiful um, connection to something that was 
long ago, but by the people of their own age. So many of the people were of um, either teenagers when they were fighting, or early 20s, or young people. And um, this is what's so important that, yes, young people should have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Claire? Well, seeing as I'm sitting next to Katie, and I have to say I absolutely love that song. It's for young people, but it's also for older people like me. Um, uh, I, I think, inspired by you, that life is like a melody, and we only understand it if we've heard the notes before, and they help us to anticipate the notes that are going to follow. So if we understand life, we have to understand history. It's all part of our existence. Um, so that sounds perhaps a little bit theoretical, but I really believe this. But I think there are other really important reasons as well for reaching out, uh, more specific reasons. For example, I think that politicians often wrap themselves up in a flag of history for all sorts of different motives. And I mean politicians from all sorts of different countries, including my own. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if young people get a jaundiced view, or an incorrect view, or an in, uh, incorrect facts, or a jaundiced view of history, they may be permanently dissuaded from getting involved. I think young people have a very strong um, sort of truth radar, and they know if they're being manipulated, and it's really important to discuss this with young people. Um, and also, I have to say, I think history is absolutely fascinating and fantastic. You know, I adore it. History is stories. It's stories of escape, drama. It's stories of passion and romance and gossip and power and death. This is what makes, you know, TV series like Game of Thrones. This is what makes most of our novels. This is what makes, well, you know, TV drama, online stuff. It's about, it's all inspired from history. And if history isn't presented as being a dry, dusty thing, if it's presented as being the meat of life, then I think you've got uh, people interested in historians for life. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. You mentioned Game of Thrones and historical dramas, uh, <clears throat> but uh, Alexandra, can uh, a person like Captain Pilecki uh, infiltrating Auschwitz even compete with uh, an officer like Captain Miller saving Private Ryan? I mean, can real life stories, true stories, compete with uh, big budget dramas? I believe yes, uh, but it takes time, yes. Poland was for 50 years behind the Iron Curtain, so we need time, yes, to share our stories. And I, I may see that in my everyday work when I meet people from all over the world and they are fascinated by what they hear, but they have never heard of it, yes. So they come to Poland and they discover a country that is full of um, incredible stories and the events that shaped the world, yes, but they were never allowed to read anything about that because from so many years, other nations and other groups of people shaped only their version of the story. So finally, after 1989, uh, Poland has this chance to publish many books and promote uh, its history among other nations. And I believe that uh, such big budget productions about true Polish heroes will appear and will enchant uh, many new generations uh, to come. Because history, you may feel it in every fibre of your inner being, yes, you just need to allow it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Scott, same question. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, and I guess it, it's determining what you believe to be a hero or a heroine, and I think, you know, um, we can all take um, examples from from genders or, or nationalities, but um, I think, you know, motivation and, and creating memory uh, and an experience that you don't forget. I remember watching The Pianist for the first time and being rocked to my core um, with grief, with sorrow, with... Um, with joy uh, at various points. And it's, it's a film that makes you never forget. And, and something like 
Saving Private Ryan whilst there is some fiction within that, it, it also does reflect back on circumstances that have happened. Um, True. And it's, and it's memorable. And I think, you know, a big task that I have at the moment and I'm working on um, is actually looking at a docu-film or docu-series of Waguna. Um, because the, the, the story um, of his life um, and the events that have taken place... Um, uh, we're being asked all the time, it should be a film, it should be something that's televised, because, again, as I've mentioned, he is a Trojan horse to tell the story of the Polish people and the suffering uh, of the families back at home and the interwoven experience of the, uh, a husband at war having to leave a country and his family and his small children, and equally, his wife with those small children being taken to the gulags and uh, the... the, the uh, the Odyssey and moving forward, which story is more important? Because for me, the the, the hero really lies within uh, the wife's role. So, um, the importance of history. Back to your 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 primary question, I always reflect on, and I get very frustrated when people say, "Well, this." this generation, this next generation, they'd never be able to do what happened in 1939. I'm frustrated with that, truthfully, because as an ex-serviceman, um, uh, you know, I, I, I've been to many countries and been involved in many conflicts and, and, and we were looking at the exhibition earlier, um, Claire, for the Ketim massacre, which was humbling and, and, and incredible. And my first thought was actually in 1993, 1994, I was looking at the same scenes in Bosnia. Um, and we have learned nothing. Um, if we rewind to January last year, um, Ukrainian teenage young adults, okay, were all sat on their social media looking at TikTok, looking at Facebook, leading very, very normal lives. They did not anticipate the invasion that took place, but they have stepped up to the mark and done what needs to be done to protect the country. The one thing that blew me away about that is the history, the learning, the Ukrainian refugees flooding over the borders and the Polish people opening their doors, as well as other European countries too. There is some learning there because it didn't necessarily happen that way back in 1939, 1940. So what I'm simply trying to say is, there is very much the place for history and learning, and we all have to uh, be very cognizant that what happens today is not what happens tomorrow. Um, and and, and we, we must look to uh, ensure that history uh, does not repeat itself, and we try to learn from the mistakes of the past and move forward in a positive direction. And it's how we do that through song, through written word, through museums. I think we all have something and, and different ways to engage the youth of today to, to, to want to know more and do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, from your personal experience, how well do young people, millennials, Generation Z and Alpha, know history? Uh, including Polish history, Claire. In Britain, I'm, I can't talk for in Poland. But we'll have yeah. to ask you. Yeah, sure. But in Britain, it. I mean, the World War history is taught. I have to say, I think a lot more could be done looking towards Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe's history is not well enough covered at the moment, I believe. But having said that, I do think there really is growing interest, um, and you can see. I mean, I personally, I've written uh, my. My best-selling book, people here will be pleased to hear, is Christina Skarbek, the Polish one. That has led to a lot more interest. So we have uh, a very famous in England, you've probably not heard of him, children's writer called Michael Morpurgo has done Christina's story as a children's book. We have, um, there are board games now in England. I'm carrying a tote bag with her face on, which was nothing to do with me. Um, there are songs, podcasts, uh, there are various novels. The authors have got in touch with me for their research. And so this story is becoming well known. But it's not just, it's not not just me, obviously. Uh, we have authors like Roger Morehouse. Um, we have stories. I think in the past, when people in Britain thought about the war, it was quite segmented. So we might, for example, think about resistance, and we would typically turn to the stories of France. And I have to say, there are fantastic stories of resistance. I'm a historian of women in conflict, and the women's resistance in France was extraordinary. 
but I think that is changing and we are now talking about Elspieta Zawatska, Christina Skarbek and so on. I think when we talked about the Holocaust in Britain, we would think about Germany and we would think about Poland. Um, but now I think we, we continue to think about those nations, but we think about Witold Pilecki. We think about Jan Karski. These names are becoming much better known. Uh, there are books by English people as well as Poles in translation. There is talk of films. My book's under option for a Hollywood film, so, you know, fingers crossed. And even things like Enigma. You know, even five years ago, when we talked about Enigma in Britain, we would immediately think about Bletchley Park um, and Alan Turing. Now, increasingly, we talk about Marianne Rejewski. Uh, there was a book, I think a few years ago, by Dermot Turing, who was Alan Turing's nephew, called X, Y, and Z, which talks about that story. There's another book come out this year about Marianne Rejewski in English. So these stories are becoming better known. I think there is further to go, but I think we, we are going in the right direction. And I, I think the, the war that you referred to, the... Russian war, uh, the aggressive war against Ukraine, has drawn world attention to this part of the world more. And that is something that we as historians uh, and other people engaged with history can also work with. So I think there is growing interest. And I just want to support something that Scott said. I also think that the young people, you know, sometimes I hear them bad mouth, they're not the greatest generation, but I think they haven't been tested in the same way. But I also think there is great interest and it's actually not for us to badmouth the youth and say they're not interested it's us to say what have we failed to do to fail to engage them the onus is on us to bring that interest to them mm -hmm. yeah thank you katie when you perform uh what's the feedback do they know what you're thinking about or not i've performed in many many different venues across british venues um british festivals all the way around there and across poland um, in many Dom Kulturis and in, in big venues. I've, I've performed in a, the crack of Philharmonia with a thousand people watching. Um, there are, um, there's a lot of love here in Poland for the music that I'm making. And, and there's a fascination that there is a British voice coming to Poland to give a fresh insight on history that maybe would be too difficult to touch because I've been writing music almost from a distance but with the heart in Poland. So, um, for instance, when I sing my song, and I have been asked to sing a bit, a bit here today by our lovely friend Ricky here in, from South Africa. So I will sing, I promise. Um, but I have had some beautiful reactions um, from veterans. Uh, unfortunately, many are, are, are not with us uh, anymore. Um, and especially my best friend in Poland, Kazimierz Piechowski, who I mentioned before, who escaped from Auschwitz in the commander's car. Um, he was the first person to teach me Polish song. And through that, I wanted to learn the Polish language. So there is this beautiful song that I'm going to give a burst of, that he, there's a first song that I learned called Dziś do Ciebie Przyszni Mogę, which is the partisan's lullaby. And for me, I think song often breaks down, music can break down boundaries that, that, that other media can't because um, not everybody can read a book, not everybody um, believes what's in a film, but a song is something that people can relate to on many different levels and it, and it transcends over different cultures and over different nations. So I'm sure, if you, who doesn't speak Polish here? Anybody doesn't speak Polish? Well, <laughs> this is a song that, I'll just sing the first little bit, but um, this is a song that tells the story of um, a, a, a man, a, a soldier who has to fight in the forest army um, and has to leave his loved one behind and probably will never see her again. And it's on my album, Pashport. Right? So um, this, so just so I don't get, because I usually play this with the ukulele, so just so that I don't, get this wrong at all. I'm going to just open it here, so. Dziś do ciebie przyjść nie mogę, zaraz idę w nocy mrok, nie wyglądaj ze mną okniem, mgle utonie próżno zwrok. Po cóż ci, kochanie, wiedzieć, że do lasu idę spać, 
Dłużej tu nie mogę siedzieć, na mnie czeka leśna broć. Dłużej tu nie mogę siedzieć, na mnie czeka leśna broć. Beautiful. Thank you very much. No wonder you've got great audiences, big audiences. I mean, in Britain, when I sing, sorry, just to fill it, from when I go to Britain, I do have to explain the history a little bit before I sing the song. So a lot of people in Britain won't really understand Central European history, but that's not their fault. And you can't be angry with people who don't understand. You know, you just have to frame it in a way that everyone can understand. And Poland, to me, is like a metaphor for the whole, you know, any conflict that's happened anywhere around the world. You know, slavery, um, terrible dislocate, dis you know, replacement of people all the way around. Yes, and, you know, um, displacement of people all the way around the world. Anyone who can understand these topics can understand the history of Poland. Thank you very much. Scott, what does it look like from your perspective? Um, I think, uh, from my perspective, um, I think my, maybe our generation, we, we're still affected by the fact that our parents or grandparents were involved in some form or another um, with the Second World War. I think to Claire's point, you know, I, I've probably maybe a, a very channeled view of the United Kingdom and it was really um, this fabulous opportunity to explore um, a different nation's um, experience has been incredible. And as I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of a team restoring a spitfire um, but I just felt this opportunity to broaden um, the general public's opportunity to know more about our neighbours um, was too good to miss. So actually um, as the travel and exhibition that we have and we take out to um, exhibitions and air shows uh, what we do is we not only talk about the restoration of the Spitfire and that is a big attraction in itself by taking a, uh, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and, and, and wings and, and machine guns and which, you know, young children are always fascinated by machine guns. Um, but what we also do is we also include the social history too. So we have pull-up posters actually from the IPN. So the big thing for me is that as I've got into this, um, I'm very grateful to authors and historians for supplying and doing the hard work. Um, but to the point of the video, it's about supplying the correct information. So I always try to ensure that whatever we do is from a reliable source um, and, and present it in a way that we engage with those younger generations. So the attraction of uh, a child or a young adult coming through to the stand is that they see Spitfire wings and Rolls-Royce Merlin engines and, and we have a few um, deactivated weapons on the stand as well which generally will bring them across and I have to tell you that that is probably a 50-50 split of male-female um, so the interest just doesn't come from the male population um, females, um, young ladies are so focused on engineering and they have a real mind a really really clever mind that works in slightly different ways to guys which is really interesting and and actually the the, the true engagement comes from those uh, those young adults that really question and quiz us and um, by virtue of the fact that they've come to the exhibition for one reason to see an engine they also take the time to read the information about the trail of hope to read about Monte Cassino, to, to read about the, uh, the Enigma situation, all the information that we can make relevant to, to the Polish experience. Um, and, and, and they end up literally spending an hour on a stand. Now, if, like my children when they were younger, trying to keep them motivated for more than five minutes and concentrated is really difficult. So to see sort of um, young adults and young children, probably from the average age of eight up to sort of 18, stand for an hour and keep coming back and asking you more questions and trying to absorb more information is incredible. So it's just trying to find a trigger, whether it's through a book. My daughters love reading. 
and someone like Claire's um, books would motivate them. It's an interesting point, you know, to look at the female perspective and, and how they've motivated through. Katie, phenomenal things again with, with the music. We know that this is a music... I think we've all been music generations and we'd all agree which one is the best decade or era. But, um, you know, the point is they engage with lyrics, they understand, they pull it apart and they want to understand more. So... Um, the younger generation, you know, they can engage, they do engage. I think it's just finding the platform to be able to do that, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alexandra, what feedback do you get in the museum? I totally agree with all of you. And just to, um, I'd like to share a story with you, which is very illustrative to what you've said. Uh, I've been working for the Walsh Rising Museum for the last eight years and some time ago. I showed the museum to a group of um, school kids and at some point a, a girl approached me and asked me, uh, Mrs. Will you be telling today the story about the doll? And I was astonished because it turned out that this girl must have been before with her parents most probably and heard my story about the doll. So the story is about a boy who, who was left behind uh, in the walls rising, he had nowhere to go. So he was staying with one of the units. He was maybe 10, 11. No one knew his name. He was known um, under a code name Torba, so a bag, because he had a bag and he would never leave this uh, bag behind. And his uh, friends from his unit were very curious what he's hiding inside this precious bag that he's never leaving it behind. And at some point, this boy um, broke down and said, you know, inside I have a photograph of my dad who uh, got executed by Germans. I have a rosary of my mom who died in a bombarded house and a doll of my sister who died with her. So this is the power of the story, yes? I, I share this story with almost all the groups I guide through the Walsh Rising Museum and I observe their reactions. And uh, I see that it really touches uh, them to the depth of their uh, being. And it's very important to target the audiences with proper stories, yes. Of course, we have this problem that um, um, uh, the current generations don't understand many words. So very often we have to explain what was the occupation, yes. What was the uh, exhumation, yes. They, they just don't get these terms. Of course, they are very specific and very historical terms. Still, for all the generations, that was quite natural, yes, to um, understand that right away. Now we have to start uh, from the very basics, yes, not to mention the fact that very often we have to explain who attacked whom. Um, so so there is a lot to, to do, but um, hope never fails, and I believe that one day uh, and those who are teenagers will grow up and with a proper guidance, with a great interest uh, uh, from their parents and from their teachers, they may finally get interested in doing something connected with history. Thank you. All right. Uh, there are lots of Polish heroes. There are pilots of the 303 squadron. There is Witold Pilecki, Kazimierz Piechowski, who was mentioned here before. There is Dan Danuta Siedzikówna, Inka. Is there an archetype, in your opinion, of a Polish hero? Uh, should we go uh, for presenting an archetype, such archetype, for instance, Pilecki or Stanisław Skalski? Or should we concentrate on uh, normal people, ordinary people, who fought, who suffered, who uh, sacrificed a lot of their lives, perhaps uh, their family? Uh, for a bigger cause. Katie. I think this is a fantastic question, Przemek. I think it's something that this does, uh, I think about quite a lot when I write my songs. Um, when I wrote my album Pashbot, um, I made several very untold, I wrote songs about untold stories. So there is a story about um, a lady called Irena Gut Opdyke, who saved her 12 Jewish friends, a Polish Catholic girl, 17 years old, saved her Polish, uh, uh, 12 Jewish friends in the basement of an SS man's house for two years. 
And um, this was such a remarkable story that hadn't been told. So when, when, you, when you're asking about an archetype, it could be an untold story, but it could also be something that's not even human. You know, you have the amazing story of the Polish soldiers uh, from, who, have, who, were, who were taken from their homes, enslaved in the gulags, and, and, and traveling through Iran, find a little bear cub. And that bear cub then <laughs> grows up to be this incredible mascot of the 22nd Artillery Supply Company of the Polish Two Corps. And his name is? Wojtek. Who? What? Wojtek. Wojtek. So you, you've, got like, <laughs> you've got these amazing stories. Um, and it's just the volume. Basically, it's just, as Alexandra says, it's the time that's needed. 50 years of totalitarian communism. Um, you know, there's, there, was, there was six years of totalitarianism in this country, you know, during the Second World War from fascism and communism and then prior to that you had 123 years where Poland was erased off the map of Europe so we do need time to put the volume of stories out there um, and so so you know I could give another burst of Wojtek to you but uh, <laughs> um, you know Wojtek is, is, is an incredible um, mascot in a way because it doesn't just tell the story of um, a bear it tells the story of a whole journey through and surviving in totalitarianism all the way to freedom, but not really freedom, because Wojtek ended up his life so, in Edinburgh Zoo and, yeah, okay. and wasn't able to return home. So, yeah. Thank you. Alexandra, from your point of view, archetype or...? Well, in a way, I'm lucky because I'm, I work for the Wolf's Rising Museum and we have that many heroes, so I may pick up <laughs> someone else um, uh, depending on the mood, depending on the group I'm guiding. Yeah? So uh, this is wonderful, but it's, it's also chilling yeah, is that people had to face so many atrocities uh, during World War II, but it's very reassuring and it's re really inspiring, motivating that people um, could um, face all those terrifying things and behave in good way. They could differentiate between the good and evil, yes. And uh, what's what's so important for me is this, this message of the war rising that human hatred may destroy anything that's material. That's what Hitler and Stalin did during World War II to Poland but cannot take over our hearts, yes, and this is a message of hope, yes, and wh whomever we take, there are that many people to write about, yes, so I believe many books will appear in the future, and um, whenever we uh, talk to younger people, older people, they are just fascinated because very often that's the very first time they hear about that. And they make, may make reference to their lives also, looking at these people, saying that they suffered so much, that they struggled, yes, and they achieved something that they didn't, they were not taken in by, by, the, bad, by the dark side. Thank you. Scott, how about you? Yeah, I think, um, again, it's... I'm with Katie on this, and also Alexandra, and I, I'm, I'm sure that Claire will probably say the same, but I think it's too difficult a question to pin all your hopes on one person when there are so very many. Um, and, 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 you know, I, my relationship now um, with Piotr, who's been dead since 1941, I, I call this a posthumous friendship. Um, I feel I know this man better than his own children, and they tell me the same. Um, you, you, you become immersed in somebody's story, but actually you soon realise that it's more than one person. Um, and, and there are so many good examples across, you know, the, the, the Polish experience. And I, I mentioned earlier, you know, my, my sort of initial experience of watching The Pianist, the film with uh, Spielmann, and, and, and it just... It, it rocked me back, and and I can think of several um, several sort of um, books and or um, films or television series where you could you could pin your Captain Miller or you know your Spielman. You could do that, but I think there's there are so many stories to tell, and I and I think you know television is a good format or podcast now, and I think 
the one thing that engages a lot of people are things like mini series. Um, so if you think of something like, as an example, Band of Brothers or The Pacific, um, which are the Tom Hanks and Spielberg kind of series, they really get you to buy in on each episode into a different character. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be in the same environment, as an example. You don't all have to be the, in the same um, team, platoon, but you could have the experience of the Warsaw Uprising, you know, you could have the espionage, espionage agent, um, you could have Wojtek, you could have this experience of a Polish pilot. But the point is there's many broad ways that you could, you could engage people into um, understanding. I, I call it baiting the hook when you go fishing. You have to put the bait on the hook to enable somebody to bite and for them to able to then want to know more. Um, and, and whichever format that that takes, that can only ever be a positive thing moving forward, I believe. Okay, thank you. Claire, so what will young people bite? Well, I mean, Polish history is incredibly rich. There are so many stories there. And I think, you know, you were asking about the archetype hero. I think for me, it's not an individual, that there are qualities, qualities that spring to mind for that would be courage, determination and humanity. And I think humanity is really at the heart of this. And it's really important when we think who are the heroes to think in diverse terms as well. So the women as well as the men, both. This, this is not a competition. There's no scale here. Um, the, the Polish Jews in the ghetto, the ghetto fighters, as well as the Polish Catholics, you know, all of this history, we need to look at that diversity. And if you want young people to engage, part of it is to see a reflection of themselves, their own experience, their own lives. But part of it is also to look out of themselves, to see the lives of their neighbors, to see, you know, to take a broader humanitarian event, uh, approach. I completely agree with what you're saying about, and it's, that is the bait really in your story, it's the door that little boy. And it is vital that we always put the humanity at the heart of the history. That's really what history is, it's human lives. And that's what I do all the time. One of the things in my new book with Elspieta Zawatska, she was a great hero for so many reasons. Uh, absolutely extraordinary lady. Um, uh, but one of, the, one of the smaller things perhaps that I love about her is that during the communist period, I mean, she survived the war, then she was arrested. Then she was sentenced to 10 years in jail, originally four years. At a retrial, they gave her eight years and then 10 years. It just got worse. Um, anyhow, she was actually released after four years. Um, and she, she realized that a lot of the history wasn't being told in this period, of course, or it's being retold, mistold. And so she kept at great risk to herself in her very small apartment in a communistly built block um, on the backs of envelopes, handwritten records. Now these are still, still exist, these are tiny bits of paper that completely filled her apartment, her very small flat. And it is the basis of an archive in Torun. And it is where most of the records of these otherwise completely forgotten anonymous women, all the women who served, wouldn't be known about. Well, actually, the Warsaw Uprising has got a lot of these stories. But there are a lot more there that are lesser known. And so I think often it's these smaller stories. Um, and Elspieta really understood that we need a balance, we need to reflect. I mean, she's got stories of women all over, from Pomerania, where she was from, but all over, and from different faith groups and none. And it's very important to remember that diversity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so we can teach history through heroes. There are so many of them, through stories of ordinary people. But the problem is that social media, where the young people are, are is filled with so much uh, entertainment that is simply easy on the eye or easy, easy on the ear. Uh, how do we convince them that uh, they should meet history instead of the Kardashians? Can I jump in? Katie? Oh. Yeah, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Who's doing it? <laughs> okay. <For> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sure we can both answer this question. Um, I, I don't think that we need to convince them to turn away from the Kardashians, not that I've watched it myself, um, and focus entirely on history. You know, this is not a competition. We have young people who have interests, and their interests can be diverse. They can love football and aircraft manufacturing and knitting. 
You know, what we need to do is look at what is it that motivates young people, what drives their interests. Then we have a tool that we can use to bring them to the history. You know, if you're in a wrestling fight, um, you don't want to just push up against that person. You, what you want to do is take their strength, their momentum, and use that channel that towards whatever it is you're trying to promote. So in this case, history. So I think, you know, actually celebrities can play a significant role in bringing young people towards history. I don't know about the Kardashians, but for example, I don't know, Captain America is basically a World War II story. It's very, very basic, but it's a starting point. Or we have films like Dunkirk recently, I, I don't know if that was released here yet, yeah? um, with Harry Styles in it. He, he's a singer. I'm not sure how good, actually, he was reasonably good in it, I thought. Um, but it might just open it up to another audience. So I think that the question is not to, to move people away, to say that this is a competition between one thing or another, but to say this is a tool that we can bring, that we can use in various different ways. Um, but I also think that if we are merging entertainment and history, that we also have to have some caution in this as well. It's that thing that I think young people are, they don't want to be, forgive my French, they don't want to be bullshitted. They want to know what is real, what is invented. And I think it is, you know, we are in the era of fake news. And I think young people are perhaps more aware than many of us realize ab about how to use social media, about what is true, what is false. And if they think they are being manipulated because Kim Kardashian wasn't actually a First World War fighter, then you've got an issue. Or if they think they're being manipulated because the government wants a particular story to be told or not told, you have to be clear, we have to be very honest. We have a contract of credibility with young people and we have to take that seriously. But that doesn't mean that we can't use celebrities in an honest way. All right, all right, great. Katie. Well, thank you for this question. Um, I do think that a lot of celebrity culture is a dumbing down of culture and it's a dumbing down of education. Um, I think that young people, when I, when I perform my workshops, especially the ones I'm doing at the currently, which are called Shpivami Historia, and I'm going around the, the schools in England, it's We Sing Our History workshops, um, the delight in the children's faces and the comments that I get after my workshops are to do with how refreshing it is to hear some real role models instead of listening to the drivel, and I'm just using that, that word that the young people use, they don't they, they are more inspired by looking at a role model that actually did something rather than somebody who's just famous for being famous or has a, a big bottom or something. I think young people are incredibly intelligent. And um, yes, I would like to see uh, more young people given the opportunity to have um, uh, access to interesting topics and not this continually continuing dumbing down of education coming from Hollywood or, 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 or places that are just solely connected with the, the creation of huge bank accounts for the celebrities. And for that reason, that is the motivation for me to see the joy on the children's faces, to have them have access to the, these incredible stories. And, you know, I can't, I can't express the joy that the children have when they sing Wojtek with me or something, or, or, or they hear something that they've never heard before, because it's boring. I'm sorry, like, celebrity culture is boring for adults, it's boring for children at the end of the day, it's boring. We, you know, people want something new and something interesting to read and, and get inspired by. Thank you. Alexandra, do you agree with Katie's yeah, diagnosis? Yes, I'm totally agreeing with all of you. And I'd like to say that uh, I observe that uh, young people and older people as well are very much detached from the real world nowadays. And it's up to the parents to encourage kids in the first place to get them attracted to certain uh, books, certain phenomena, certain stories, yes. Um, I observe that um, lots of parents don't have time and they don't devote time to their kids. And this spare time, this leisure, this void is unfortunately filled by the internet. Uh, the internet that is full of empty messages, yes. And if parents had time to take that void, uh, 
and fill it with something special, even with talking to their kids. Just uh, let's go back in time and look at the times when there was no internet and families were forced to talk. If kids were being uh, pushed to the courtyards, they would meet with their friends, they would play, they would do lots of silly things, but they would interact, yes. But now we have lots of sociopaths, yes, because we are left with our screens and that that totally does not match what we as humans are prepared for. Maybe in 1,000 years, human beings will be ready to stay in front of the smartphones for uh, the whole day. Right now, we are not ready for that. And that creates lots of problems, especially for young generations. And that's what we observe uh, when we look at the museum groups. Yes, very often those who come from the big cities, unfortunately, cannot stand still are distracted by everything because uh, they are, of course, um, wealthy and they have everything, but in fact they have nothing, yes, because no one gives them proper attention. Thank you. Scott, what's your opinion? I think um, all, all points really well covered, um, but I think um, I, I always think about how do we engage people. and. Um, Social media is one big thing, and, and I think there's no escaping social media and uh, celebrities. I think, actually, there are quite a few celebrities, certainly in the UK, that are engaged and interested in history, you know, realistically, and they, they do have a genuine passion for it, and often it's people that you'd be very surprised by, and they are the Harry Styles or whoever the pop star is or the, 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 the famous broadcaster that, you know the younger generations associate with. And, and I think by blending them into activities, that is a good thing because there is, you know, by, um, by circumstance, there's a pull into that. But I was thinking about it over the last few years before COVID about trying to, how do we best engage pretty much all generations, but really those, those younger age groups. And, and I'd started to organize what I called uh, the 16 to one festival. So it was gonna be about essentially based on the, the, the Battle of Britain, but not about the Battle of Britain. And the 16 to 1 relevance was that actually, despite popular opinion, if you speak to people in the UK, and this again is the teaching of history, that the Royal Air Force did not defeat the Luftwaffe by themselves. Um, there were actually 16 different na uh, nationalities of pilot that took, uh, took part in the battle itself. And I thought it, this would be a great way to engage um, uh, the youth by creating a festival that was around music, it was around history, it was about the culture of each of those individual 16 nations that actually we've got far more in the UK now. Um, but the point was, could we get younger generations to come together in an enjoyable experience which wasn't just about dull history, but it was baiting that hook again to get them along and have you know um, vehicles there, uh, you know exhibitions there to engage them. Having Katie there singing about you know uh, you know the Polish aspect of the war, to have Claire there talking about you know um, the, the the female expectation and uh, and the, the, the celebration and contribution. But it's again, I refer to my own children. They're not really children now; they're all grown up. But they love music festivals. They love festivals. So why don't we create, I mean, this is a fantastic um, event to be at here today in the next few days. It's brilliant. Me and Claire took some time to walk around. There's so many engaging ways to engage all age groups of, of, of young adults as well as big adults, big children. Um, but a festival, maybe, you know, again, it's, a, it's an opportunity to engage and you can engage some of those celebrities that we talked about to bring them across. It's just trying to think of a, a different way to actually attract people to history um, a little bit by baiting the hook. Um, and they learn a lot along the way and get a bigger interest. So the panel have already covered the majority, but again, it's just trying to think a little bit outside of the box to make things... Um, uh, unique, special. Why would you want to come? Well, if you know you've got some bands playing there and they could play some music that's relevant, then I think that would be good. Just an idea. Yeah, it will. <clears throat> sure. Thank you. Uh, all right. Now, let's imagine you come across uh, outrageously manipulated history uh, on your, well, on social media. How do you address that? What do you do? 
someone posts a comment um, on your Facebook, for, for instance, Scott? This is an interesting one because we, again, I, I, I do this project really in my spare time. Although if you ask my girlfriend, she'll tell you I do it full time on top of a full time job. Um, but actually keeping on top of social media can be a challenge and, and you do get trolls, you do get people who are negative and, and as I've mentioned we try to keep everything that we put onto the, the social media side of things and the website to be factually correct. Sometimes you can get things a little bit incorrect but then also you get um, people who just really want to pick an argument for the sake of picking an argument and that can be difficult because your initial reaction is to be frustrated. Um, but actually, I think the way that you manage it, uh, unless it's absolutely aggressive and inappropriate, um, I'm happy to handle and, 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 and sort of post back in a, in a calm, cool, light-headed way. Um, but if it's, you know, if it is really quite a, a defamatory, I, I will take that down. But I think, you know, we're here because we have a freedom of speech and, and often... Um, it, certainly with the Spitfire and talking about the Polish Air Force and trying to, to broadcast to a global audience, often, ironically, it's the Polish who will come at us quite hard. Um, and, and it's often um, the, 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 the challenge of, you know, Great Britain betrayed Poland, um, you took all our money at the end of the war, and all these kinds of facts, which, are, again, to come to the point, aren't all actually true. Um, but trying to manage that can be... A challenge sometimes but you know again it's about trying to correct um, you know disinformation but again making sure that you're factually correct so it it can be difficult to manage that truthfully but I think with a cool head because I don't know about anybody else when you receive a text message that annoys you and you start to reply and then you stop and you delete it and then you start typing again, and then you stop, and you delete it. And you do it about four or five times, and then you think, I'm not going to send it. You just say, okay, or whatever it is. But it's always that situation, especially on social media, because whatever you put, you'll be, you know, you'll be judged by. So you have to be very careful with that. And it's not just me that I represent now. I'm representing, as far as I'm concerned, um, the, uh, the memory of 18,000 Polish Air Force personnel. So it's, it's being measured as being objective with what you do, but it can be difficult to manage sometimes. Yes, it can. Alexandra, you probably get such messages on the channels you run for. Yes, unfortunately, many, many historical distortions, um, very often the usage of our iconographic um, materials referring to some other events in history. And the problem is that there are, in fact, no tools to delete those distortions. Yes, I may react, I may reply, I may kindly ask, generally I kindly ask uh, in direct message a given organization, a given institution to, to correct a tweet, to delete the tweet, 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 because on Twitter that's uh, the in intensity of all of that on Twitter is uh, terrifying. Uh, but the problem is that most of the, in most of the cases, no one reacts, yes. And it's very sad because some institutions have 80,000 followers and that the world went out. Yeah. And you have hundreds of thousands impressions in the world. And I may reply, I may ret um, quote, tweet, but no one, no one sees that, yes, in a proper way. So it, that's very problematic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Katie? This is a really difficult question because I'm in the public sphere a lot. I'm an independent musician. I, I can write about songs. I can write about the topics that I want to write about. I'm not censored by a publisher or an A&R man. And, and so when I release my albums, they are maybe touching on subjects that really are either untold or, or subjects people don't really want to hear about. But I do really want to um, stress that I welcome criticism and I welcome comments. Um, obviously, if the comments are coming from um, a, a Russian bot, I had my Facebook page removed because a Russian bot got um, uh, access to it or, or, or trolled and I had to fight to get my Facebook page back. Um, I, I have been 
a victim of this, but I welcome criticism because it helps to inspire my direction. And I know that actually the hate, if you have people who love you and people who hate you, then this is a good job. I'm doing a good job. So um, in that respect, I think it's really important to talk about that. But if it, if it does get to a level, I, I will just simply block. But I am very frustrated with the uh, misinformation about Poland. And I'm frustrated with um, the idea that people from abroad um, think that they have more, you know, more entitlement to the voices of those people in Poland who experience that. And that's what's frustrating, especially when it comes to the Holocaust. And of course, being a third generation Holocaust, I can say escapee, you know, there are vo forgotten voices there that need to have their voice uh, voices shared. And when I did my project with Kazimierz Bichowski in, in Britain, I was called all sorts of names. I was called a Holocaust denier. I was I was I was told that I uh, have no right to um, approach this history without anybody understanding the reason and what what lay behind my motivation, which is my own grandfather as a prisoner to 2661 in Auschwitz. So I find that the Holocaust topic is something that's a really difficult topic, but you know, we ride the wave. Okay, thank you. Claire? Uh, yes, yeah, sadly, I've also had a lot of abuse for my historical work and perspectives, and I'm sorry to hear that you have as well, Katie. Um, so I think, I mean, we all know that the algorithms of Twitter are, they, they channel us into extremes. They prevent detailed analysis or subtle conversation and nuance just disappears completely. Um, so, you know, when we, when we promote history, our books, our work, whatever, on the internet, obviously we have to be aware that this is something that is likely to come up and to deal with it. In general, I think it's important to focus on putting the stories out, the history out that we know about, to ensure that there are the answers on there for people doing searches, to promote the positive. I think it's really important to take uh, that approach rather than giving 90% of your time to collect, correcting one troll who's got a specific detail wrong. Having said that, if someone puts anything, particularly on one of my threads, I feel I am responsible because I have enabled that person to have a platform to some extent, and so I will take it on. And I mean, all I would say is, you know, be clear, be concise, be polite, you know, and try and shut it down. But that's, that's mainly my approach on doing it. Um, but I also think the other thing to always bear in mind, and, and, and this has worked with me, is that I see this as an opportunity to change an opinion. It may not be the opinion of that troll, but it might be some of their followers. What I don't see it is the opportunity to have a good old argument or to have a fight. That's never going to help anyone. So I, I think looking at the positive, what you can take from that, is the most important way to move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I may not have asked the question you would like to ask, so now is your chance to ask our panelists whatever you wish. Hi, my question is, I'm a researcher of the Holocaust and also politics of memory and centrist in Europe, and I have a question to Alexandra, because I also work a lot with social media, and you said that usually when you see uh, wrong posts, you just, uh, you know, write politely to these people or institutions. Um, but I'm thinking also in the light of, uh, you know, the change of ownership of Twitter and all these things, maybe perhaps there should be, I don't know, um, a common uh, effort to talk to you know the owners of social media platforms and uh, to make sure that they create not just um, what they do now with disinformation related to politics but also to history. So what do you think about this? I don't know, what can we do? Thank you. That would be wonderful, yes, to have such tools and maybe in the future um, we'll be able to report and maybe I don't know, block those who cause so much damage on Twitter. Of course, uh, I believe that Twitter is a great pat platform where people from the right, from the left, may express, express their views. 
Uh, however, sometimes it goes too far. So we have, uh, let's say, historians who promote left-wing a version of history and they have left-wing uh, followers and we have right-wing uh, historians who promote right-wing uh, history and it's it's very problematic yes to convince either side to come on the truth is only one yes and of course we may interpret it in different ways but we should give it a try yes so I, I hope that one day it will change because it's, it really um, um, uh, destroys the perception of people who don't have a profound knowledge on certain uh, subjects. Uh, we were mentioning historical distortions. In many cases, people just don't know. So, for example, when I reply to a given person and say, come on, um, it was totally different, then you say, really? Sorry, uh, I'm going to correct it right away. And uh, um, we need to work on that, yeah. No, I'm not. Thank you for asking. Can I jump in as well on that one? A really interesting question. I'm really glad you raised it because I think this is such an important debate. And I suppose I'm slightly inconsistent on this one because uh, obviously there was a famous trial not that long ago about Holocaust denial that was made into a film called Denial. Um, and really interesting because if somebody is a Holocaust denial, I get, you know, I see red. And, and this is sort of my end point. I feel that ultimately always has to be challenged. On the other hand, who decides what is the truth in history? What I think I would always argue for is rigorous, free academic debate. When any state or any institution or any single group comes in and says, this is the correct view, in 20 years, that may be challenged a different way. There may be new evidence. There may be new perspectives. You can go through history. I mean, this is why we can have, let's take it out of the Second World War, Elizabeth I or Cleopatra. You can have different biographies throughout history. In England, in the Victorian period, <clears throat> our perspective would be very different. We develop new, we, get, we gather more information, which opens things up, and we have different lenses to look through. So perhaps a feminist lens might look very differently to a great male history of you know, the Tudor women who were just there to bear children or something. So I think it's really important that we don't have a state-sanctioned picture of this is what we can discuss, or this is the right answer, this is the right history. Having said that, you know, they weren't Polish concentration camps. They were Nazi German concentration camps in Nazi-occupied Poland. You know, it's important to correct this, but I think it's a correction. I don't think state direction on this, I don't think legislation is ever a good idea. Okay, any more, any more questions? Hi, Alexander Smarga, um, architect. Uh, I've got a question to uh, the distinguished members of the panel, uh, because we're all a bunch of believers, you know, we're all on the Allied side, you know, the British, the Poles, uh, French, <laughs> and all the rest, yeah? But how, how would you uh, talk about this Second World War history uh, when you meet uh, people from the other side. Maybe I will start right yeah. away, because at the museum we have different guests. We have uh, many groups from Germany. We used to have some guests from Russia, so occasionally I would show the museum to the Russians, and that was also a very interesting experience. So. Um, uh, you, you meant that. Yeah, and what are the reactions? Yeah, so um, whenever I meet the Germans at the museum, I observe that they are very much detached from what happened. So they, they are really interested in history, but they unfortunately visit our museum as a kind of a Star Wars museum, and they are shocked by what they see, but they don't associate that with their proper history. It's not about accusing them and their grandparents for what they did in in Poland during World War II, but to be a bit more compassionate about what happened. When it comes to the Russians who whom I guided at the Warsaw Rising Museum, these were people who um, were not um, politicians. These were ordinary people who suffered also 
very much during World War II, and they had very similar experiences from the communist times and from the times of World War II. So we shared uh, experiences uh, regarding famine and rapes uh, uh, committed by the Red Army. So uh, there was a lot of understanding here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when it comes, for example, to German visitors who were our main aggressors in 1939, um, in a way they learned a lesson because they, they tried to do something about the past. Um, but we don't know uh, what the future brings, yes, and how much will they go further in this detachment and who knows, it's a political question, yeah. <laughs> Can I, can I say something? Um, yes, well, I see my singing as a form of resistance. So for me, I welcome um, any, any criticism, as I said before, but I also welcome all people from all walks of life and all backgrounds to come to my concerts. And yes, you know, if I'm singing about something that um, is so important to my Polish roots, but is not understood on the other on the other side. For instance, um, I went to perform to some Japanese audiences. Now the Japanese were an Axis power during the Second World War, and you know, as you know, like the British pilots and many 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 servicemen from the Allies really suffered in the Japanese concentration camps. We can call them really that. Um, it's it's fascinating that the younger generation actually have almost skipped through so many different generations that you, you have um, an open card in a way to explain things in a new way. And um, so I found this quite an interesting, interesting question from you, Alexander, because um, it's difficult to hold an animosity towards the audience when all they want to do is, is, no, is no more. And I think that's that's the value of song because, as I said before, song can um, transcend barriers. It can it can it can blast through barriers, and uh, especially um, songs about Polish history because, as a Polish Poland in itself is a metaphor for any country that's been um, uh, occupied, that's been attacked, that's been, you know, had its land stolen, there's been murder, blood, on literally every single meter of this land. So, yes, it, it's, it's a fascinating story, and I'm hoping that, um, that more understanding about it is going to take place. Um. Hello, my name is Monica, and I, first of all, I wanted to thank you so much for this great panel. And my question is about the social media. Like, do you apply any social media strategies and how difficult it is to run social media in your respective areas? And how difficult is it to get to the younger generation? Thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yes, I, I do use social media, so I'm on several different platforms. I'm not on TikTok, haven't worked that one out yet. My kids are on TikTok. There's a thing called BookTok that apparently I should be on. Um, so yes, I do use it, and I, it is um, useful as a tool. I mean, we've talked about some of the downsides, but there is, I mean, also, social media is here to stay, whether we like it or not, much like uh, celebrity culture, it is there. It's a reality we deal with. Um, and it has enabled me to reach new audiences. For example, um, with some of the, the, after some of the posts I've put up, it's led to new podcasts um, for a different generation who I might not have reached through other ways, or even uh, not just podcasts, but other uh, outlets as well. Um, so I, I do use it and reaching young people, um, it has helped me and it's also social media has led me to be followed by a number of, I give a lot of talks at schools, uh, so I reach out to younger generation that way and at history festivals where there's often um, uh, school groups coming in and separate areas with reenactment and different talks for school or you know different age children. So I do work in that area as well and quite often I'm invited because a school history department has seen me on social media and then oh that's really interesting that's a different perspective we haven't considered. So it, it is it has definitely proved its worth for me as well as being problematic in other areas yeah. I'd agree. I think um, 
as I say, social media is, is, is either a thing you love or, or you loathe. Um, and, and I, Claire knows this already, but this morning, that my biggest frustration with social media is that if you put something that's to do with history, if I put up a picture of Piotr Waguna with some meaningful information, which is actually very important and a takeaway message, I may get 25, 50 likes on Facebook. Now, this morning before breakfast, I put on a lovely picture of a Spitfire, and I'm already at 1,000 likes and 60 shares because they like a picture. There's no time to read information. So getting the message across is very difficult and very frustrating. Um, so Claire's absolutely right. It, it, it can be meaningful because in those 100 likes, you know, there may be, let's say, 5 or 10% of the people that will want to know more and look into the, the website or the page in a bit more detail to understand. But it also presents more opportunities to go to educational facilities, to be asked to go and do more. And, and like Claire, we do get asked to go to schools. So we get lots of teachers, actually, who see the exhibition and what we're discussing and talking about and will ask us to go and present and take the exhibition along. And actually, even um, industries, you know, businesses will ask us to go along to understand more because actually, from an economic standpoint, trading within Europe, I know that Great Britain sits outside now, but actually trading, um, it's important to understand there's a lot of Anglo-Polish trade that goes on. Understanding your, your, your own cultures and history is a good way to engage your, your, your employees as well. So um, social media, we, we, we use it a lot for the project. It does give us a worldwide audience. We get on average about one million um, view, or we reach about a million people a month. Um, average post interactions is around about 60,000. Um, so that's pretty good, really. So you are getting those interactions going on, but you, you have to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But you do reach the people that you need to, but you have to gain those audiences. And we've been really passive. I refuse to pay any money to boost posts or anything like that. So we're on about 25,000 people on, on Facebook, and that's all come from people liking and going through. So getting the historical mes message across is difficult. So you really have to mask it up. It's baiting the hook. The hook is a lovely picture of a Spitfire mm -hmm. to get them to look into the other posts that will give them the history detail beyond that. Uh, hello. I try my, my English. Uh, first thing I wanted to ask, what do you think uh, about um, very interesting interactive lessons like uh, very popular in Poland now, escape rooms. Uh, this is my experience with my children. I have four. So I can uh, observe how they, uh, how they, um, what, what they like to use as a information basis. So as, as this hook was this. Uh, so uh, it was for me a very, very interesting experience when my um, young children, uh, 12 years a girl uh, visited an escape room where the um, where the action was in uh, put in the uh, 1944 uh, uprising yes and i think this interaction is something that we can use what do you think as a institution or or a creator and the second uh, what you, as a performer, as a composer, think to make a real musical about Polish history. Why? Why? This is also the impression of a mother that uh, last time I observed that my uh, children love mu American musicals. And then, in the school, asked about the American history, they know everything about this part of, his, of, of American history that is put in a simple musical that t takes two hours, I think. And I, I give you a, 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 an idea, yes, uh, in a, in a um, cooperation with the Polish Institute, it, it is worth to make a musical. Because the people, the young people, 12, 13, 15 age, uh, years old, they like music. 
but they also like the interaction, to, to look the movement on the scene, yes? And I think it's an idea to, to, to take and, and develop, yes? And um, this was the interaction, but I have also other experience. Uh, you, you told a lot of uh, German visitors. I was uh, in Germany, in the Eastern uh, Germany, late 80s. I was attending to the school, and I know what they are teaching about the Second World War. This is a catastrophe. So they don't know. They uh, uh, they don't they they don't know, and they don't want to know what the the grandparents did. I was in the school, and as I was impressed of the acknowledge of the, uh, they are teach that we we are we are not existing. Uh, Poland is a, is a, is an empty space in the German history. They're, they are they're nothing. So uh, my experience was very bad, very sad, and I think. Um, IPN and uh, other institu institutions have a very big job to do, to learn Germany, its own history, and to present our point of view and our history, yes? Uh, so my, uh, my, my, my last question would be to you. What are you doing to present our history abroad to the Germans, mm -hmm. for instance? Well, there were many exhibitions organized uh, in, in Germany in recent years. And as I said, Germans express a lot of understanding to what happened, but they rarely do anything further on. So that, that's the problem, yes. Uh, the wonderful thing would be to um, enable as many school exchanges as possible, yes, but there has to be willingness among different institutions to do so. Uh, but it will take years, uh, I'm afraid, yes. We're doing our best, but well, sometimes it doesn't receive the ground. Well, can, I cut, can I cut in here? <laughs> um, yes, I was talking about the escape route with Kazimierz Zbichowski and his escape from Auschwitz. I think this is a fantastic idea and a fantastic idea for a musical, which I have thought about. Uh, when I was researching this topic around 10 years ago, when Kazik was alive, I actually approached the Steyr factory in Austria to try to do something with them, saying that, you know, this is a story of a Polish Boy Scout that escaped in a Steyr 220 car, of which, of course, the factory um, slammed down the phone and <laughs> didn't want any connection with the story whatsoever, because, obviously, their factory created the cars for the commandants of Auschwitz. So it is really testing, um, and it is a, a total tragedy that this, this history has been deleted from uh, the, German, the German education system. Um, and I, I do think that it's, it's something that is, is really a hard uphill um, it's a hard uphill mission because you are absolutely going against the grain when you mention something about that. And, and you're right, you know, the young, young people in Germany, well, their grandparents, their great-grandparents were the SS officers. They were the people that came into and invaded Poland and shot people in the street in Warsaw. You're absolutely right. So a musical about this, well, it's a tough topic for a, for a musical but maybe there's a way I can possibly, with your, with your inspiration, um, put together my concert, which um, usually involves a lot of multimedia with you know, projections of um, the faces of the heroes and heroines when I'm singing the songs and create some sort of experience like um, what um, Scott was talking about, a festival kind of um, approach and, and, and give an atmosphere, atmospheric experience. Um, but thank you so much for this wonderful question. And what's your name? Camilla. Camilla, thank you so much. That's a really great question. Thank you. I think I just wanted to add one thing as well about some experience that I had um, from a German perspective. Um, 
we we get lots of interesting people come to the stand and talk to us from all over the world, often visiting the UK, but they'll come and talk about their experiences. And um, on one of the last shows I had, I had a, a, a German um, gentleman come along to the stand and um, we, we tell the story. So with Waguna, he was shot down actually a month before um, he was shot down again. Um, but he was shot down by um, a German pilot, but we include that as part of the story and we research that German pilot. Um, and we told the story of that German pilot as well. Um, we also told the story of the, the, the German um, anti-aircraft crews that were at the site that shot him down on his final journey on the 27th of June, 1941. And this German gentleman was, was surprised that we would tell that story as well, but it is part of the story. And actually, he, he stood there for an hour and spoke to us. And at the end of it, um, he was offering me all of his both of his sets of grandfather's uniforms. Uh, and I said, that's lovely, but it's not quite where we're going with this. Um, and, and he's kind of, when he's asking me this, he's very doing it in a very low tone of voice so that nobody can hear. And he says, I just don't know what to do with it. The only thing we can do is put it in a black plastic bag and throw it in the bin. Um, it's just amazing the experience because he was interested to know that we would tell the story from that German perspective, but was almost in the same breath very ashamed of what had happened from his point of view. And I, I will tell you, that's not the only experience I've had with um, German people coming to talk to me uh, from, from that project point of view. So just an interesting experience, broadly talking about how they feel. I think they just really would like to park it and put it to one side and move on um, is my, my, my humble experience, but that is not what we're here to discuss or do. We can't do that, um, but that's just an experience. Hi, uh, I'm Yanis Svardovic. Uh, I'm head of Encountering anti politism Limited. Uh, my question is directed primarily at Claire. Uh, it's a follow-up to what you were talking about earlier about the idea that government shouldn't ban, obviously, research or knowledge. I fully support that, but then there seemed to be a slightly contradictory thing when we were talking about trying to get Twitter not to do it. So if I give you in, in another example, in approximately 2014, the then Polish ambassador in the UK wrote to the BBC asking them for various things. As part of their reply, they stated that Polish death camp could not be banned because it was a possibility it could be used legitimately. Do you think it's right to campaign to get organisations to ban the term, or do you think that's wrong as well? Gosh, big question. Um, thank you very much for it as well. I mean, this is really important, and I wish we could have another session, actually, that just looked at the whole question of legislation and large organisational change. Um, I mean, as I said, it is slightly contradictory. We, Holocaust denial itself is illegal in Germany, and it, there has been a court case uh, with um, that appalling, gosh, what's his name, historian? If we can, Irving, David Irving, yeah, if we can call him a historian. Actually, I might row back on that one a little bit. Um, and I felt that it was fantastic. Well, I thought it was appalling that it had to go to court, but obviously the result was correct. Um, so I don't think that a, any state should dictate policy either internationally or domestically. I think there's a bit of an elephant in the room here, which is perhaps the Jan Gross case with his book, Neighbours. And uh, the, over many years, there have been different perspectives. Of course, he now lives in um, the United States. And there is an issue, I think, around the criminalization of statements such as the, 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 I mean, the Polish state did not collaborate with the Holocaust. Let's be absolutely clear about it. But Poles, some of them, were collaborators. I have to say, the Polish state is the only state that didn't have a, a quizzling government that was occupied. And if you go to Yad Vashem, there are more Polish names among the righteous of nations than there are of any other nation. And when you talk about this, you cannot talk about one point without giving that complete context. But it is also wrong to say that no Poles collaborated, because they did. And also British people did. And there were German resistors, but they were a minority. 
most of the Germans were not doing that, but they do exist. History is nuanced, and if we take that nuance out, and if we, you know, take legislation is such a blunt tool that I think it is unhelpful. So I think there are better ways to deal with it. I mean, that is my perspective. I can see there are problems in it. I can see it's very difficult. History is difficult. History is nuanced. If we try and take the complications out of it, it becomes a gimmick and a cartoon. And I think what's really important is to talk about truths and to talk about them openly and to enable academic freedom and not to prescribe, but to encourage the most plural plurality and diversity we can in these debates. Thank you, Claire. Do we have any more questions? Hi, hello, my name is Magda. <clears throat> I am a scout uh, and uh, I am one of the leader uh, in the projects who, in which we decided to go by bikes uh, to the path of General Anders Army. Uh, we decided about it because for us as a scouts it's important to learn history and we know that in school it's not as we would like to it be. <laughs> and my question is, because uh, I just came from Iraq two weeks ago, uh, and uh, my question is uh, about the social media, which we should choose, because to be honest, during the trip it, it's really hard to do Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, uh, and uh, some meetings with the people, with the, sometimes with the Polish people, with the embassy, which, in your opinion, which channels, sh channels should be the, the most important for us during the project? After then, of course, we, we've got a lot of plans to, to make a lot of meetings, but during the, the trip, w which we should choose? Thank you. Thank you, that was actually the questions I didn't have time to ask, but, <laughs> but most productive uh, social media channels. I, I think you have to really aim it at your audience. So if you're in a group of younger scouting, if that's, is that your audience that you're not only? So I, I think you have to look far and wide. So from my point of view, the average age of somebody following the project from our point of view is probably between 45 to 65, truthfully. Um, and then you have the split down of demographics between gender and all those kinds of things. So it's, it's a really difficult question. And again, it depends on how you're managing it because it's so time consuming as well. So I, I and the project focus really with Facebook. That seems to get a good, a good um, saturation point with that. And you're able to move with that. But I know that, you know, again, TikTok to Claire's point of view is is a good way. Um, it's a current way, as far as I'm aware, with the younger generations. But from Claire's point of view and my point of view, I have no idea. I've never even been on TikTok, so I couldn't tell you what it's about. So it's a difficult decision. Instagram, we do do Instagram, we do do Twitter. I like Twitter because it, actually it saves me time in my day as well, actually, by the restriction of what you can write and what you can't write. Um, so... It's a really difficult question. Also, I mean, there are some little hacks. Like, if you post on Instagram or Facebook, it can automatically do the post for you. And I think there are other things like that you can do to save yourself a little bit of time. And yeah. um, the other thing to think about, I think, and I'm totally with you, it depends on your audience. And if you're going for everyone, I mean, use as many channels as you can find time to do. But also how you are telling your message, because... As far as I understand it, TikTok is a short film. Yeah. Instagram tends to be more a still photograph, but you can put video out there, but it's more visual. Twitter, I mean, everything needs a visual, but you might use less the film. You might use more one still and a you know, sharp little anecdote. So I, I think the, the medium also might affect your choice of channel. Yeah. And, and just to add to that as well, what I would say is in our experience, we've tried to create small videos um, you know, in and around the Polish Air Force and, and that, that whole period of the Second World War. And they're fantastic videos. I'm really, really proud of them. And we said, we'll keep them at two and a half minutes so they're not too long. The average view of a video is about eight seconds. So people switch on and then they switch off and you think, why are you missing all this incredible information? But it's incredible to you. So, you know, it comes to that point around TikTok, which is eight or nine seconds, and that's what they're interested. So it's snapshot from that point of view, but what's gonna 
get that hook. So again, Claire's absolutely right. Okay, and uh, more questions maybe? <coughs> if not, we should be wrapping up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being with us today. I personally have learned so much from our panelists about different perspectives, about different channels, about different approaches. And uh, please, let's thank them for contributing to my and your knowledge. Thank you very much as well. Some great questions. Thank you.